Hello, this is Shanil Jain with World Medical School and today I will talk about Diabetes Insipidus and SIADH or Syndrome of Inappropriate Antidiuretic Hormone. I will discuss the pathophysiology of ADH, the different types of diabetes insipidus, causes, how to diagnose and treat them, SIADH and its treatment and finally a comparison between the two. So let's start by talking about the pathophysiology of antidiuretic hormone. This is a very high yield slide as the concepts on this slide appear frequently in step 1, 2 and 3. ADH is made by the supraoptic nucleus present in the hypothalamus. It is stored in the posterior pituitary gland along with oxytocin. ADH is commonly known as arginine vasopressin or AVP, vasopressin, argipressin, desmopressin or DDAVP. The stimulus of ADH is low volume or an increased osmolarity. It is also secreted in response to stress. When kidney gets a signal that the body is low in volume, it secretes renin from the juxta granular apparatus with input from macular densa. Renin then converts angiotensinogen from the liver to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is then converted by angiotensin converting enzyme from the lungs to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 has four functions. It vasoconstricts the efferent arteriole in the kidneys. It stimulates the release of aldosterone from zona glomerulosa in adrenal cortex. Aldosterone controls the sodium-potassium ATPase pump, which increases sodium and water reabsorption. Angiotensin II also stimulates the thirst center in the brain. And lastly, it secretes ADH from posterior pituitary, which goes to the V2 aquaporin receptors at collecting duct in the kidney to reabsorb water and concentrate the urine. The whole purpose of the renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway is to hold on to the water. Patients with diabetes insipidus present with increased thirst, increased urination, which can lead to dehydration, but there is no glucose in the urine. Primary polydipsia, also known as psychogenic polydipsia, is usually seen in patients with mental disorders. They tend to drink water from wherever they can find it, even if it is from a toilet bowl. They can have abnormally low levels of sodium and can present with seizures. Central diabetes insipidus has a deficiency of ADH, while nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, there is enough ADH, but the receptor doesn't work. Causes of central diabetes insipidus could be idiopathic, brain tumors, brain surgery, trauma to the head, hereditary, or even hypoxia. A common cause of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus that is highly tested in exams is lithium toxicity. This can be seen in someone who has bipolar disorder. Other causes include electrolyte disturbances like hypercalcemia or hypokalemia, renal diseases, pregnancy, which could be temporary as it may resolve spontaneously after pregnancy, hyperglycemia, hereditary and drugs, among which amphotericin B and demicocycline are highly tested. It's important to know how to diagnose diabetes insipidus. The pathway in this slide is very high yield for the exam. So when a patient presents with increased urination or low urine osmolarity, the first step is to deprive them of water. This is known as the water deprivation test. If the kidney responds by increasing urine osmolarity, then it is primary or also called psychogenic polydipsia. If after water deprivation, the kidney does not respond, and the urine osmolarity is unchanged, 
then the diagnosis is diabetes insipidus. Now, in order to differentiate between central versus nephrogenic, you would give them antidiuretic hormone. If the kidney responds by increasing urine osmolarity, it means there was a deficiency of ADH. So the diagnosis is central diabetes insipidus. And if the kidney does not respond and the urine osmolarity is low, the diagnosis is nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. The treatment of primary or psychogenic polydipsia involves institutionalizing the patient with close monitoring. Low levels of sodium need to be corrected as well. In central diabetes insipidus, since the problem is a deficiency in ADH, you treat them by giving ADH. Desmopressin is a modified form of the normal hormone arginine vasopressin it binds to the V2 receptors in the renal collecting ducts and increases water reabsorption. In nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, thiazide diuretics may be used. This is due to the paradoxical effect of thiazides. Thiazide diuretics result in water excretion from the body. So now the body is in low volume state. So the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is activated as we saw in the second slide earlier. This leads to an increased sodium and water reabsorption at the proximal tubule. Therefore, less sodium and water is delivered to the distal tubule and collecting duct, and thus lowering the overall urine output. Endomethacin is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, or NSAID, which inhibits prostaglandin synthesis and reduces the delivery of solute to distal tubules, thus reducing urine volume and increasing urine osmolality. For lithium-induced diabetes insipidus, amylaride, which is a potassium-sparing diuretic, has been shown to be useful because it blocks uptake of lithium into principal cells allowing them to regain responsiveness to ADH. SIADH, or Syndrome of Inappropriate Antidiuretic Hormone. It is a condition where there's too much ADH present in the body. Test writers love the association of SIADH and small cell lung cancer. They may describe a patient who complains of chronic coughing, history of smoking, along with low levels of sodium. Other causes of SIADH include subarachnoid hemorrhage, meningitis, restrictive lung diseases, some drugs, and HIV infection. For subarachnoid hemorrhage, they may describe a patient with severe headache and low sodium. For meningitis, they may say fever, neck stiffness, photophobia, along with a low sodium. Lab values in SIADH. The volume status in SIADH is euvolemic, which is also seen in conditions like hypothyroidism, psychogenic polydipsia, and postoperatively. Sodium is low, and so is the plasma osmolality because of increased ADH reabsorbing excess water. Urine osmolarity and urine sodium are high because all the water is being absorbed. Also, low BUN and uric acid may also be seen. Treatment. One has to treat the underlying cause when known and also manage the degree of hyponatremia and its consequences. For mild hyponatremia between 120 to 130, with no symptoms, fluid restriction is the best first step. For moderate hyponatremia between 110 to 120 with mild confusion, normal saline with a loop diuretic like furosemide can be given. For severe hyponatremia, less than 110 with severe confusion, seizures, lethargy, etc., 3% hypertonic saline is the best step. 
for chronic SIADH, fluid restriction with demeclocycline can be used. Demeclocycline works by reducing the responsiveness of the collecting tubule cells to ADH. A key point to note here is while correcting sodium level, one should not correct too rapidly. No more than 10 to 12 milli equivalents per day. This might lead to central pontine malonolysis or logged in syndrome where the patient can only blink their eyes but cannot move. Other drugs like conibeptan and toloptan, which are antagonist at V1, V2 receptors can also be used based on their side effect profiles. Now let's compare lab values in diabetes insipidus and SIADH. ADH in diabetes insipidus is normal to low, which means kidney is unable to absorb water. So plasma osmolality and sodium will be high. And since there is too much water in the urine, the urine osmolality and urine sodium will be low. And finally, in SIADH, the lab values will be exactly opposite than that of diabetes insipidus.